and welcome to this e-lecture. My name is Nihad de Lalouche and I'm a research scientist at Schlumberger Cambridge Research. So I'm going to talk about how we can accurately me measure the spatial gradient of the seismic wave field. But first of all, why are we interested in measuring uh, the gradients? Well, gradients are sensitive to changes in the wave field, which can be attributed to changes in the elastic properties and therefore to variation in the near surface. Seismic uh, gradients provide information on the local velocity and slownesses, which can be used either to separate the P and the S waves or uh, to uh, invert for shear wave profiles. They, are also, they provide also useful information uh, for noise attenuation and for solving spatial aliasing problems. So I'll start by uh, discussing the basic of translation, rotation, and gradient measurements. Then I'll continue uh, to discuss how we can obtain gradient measurement by taking a difference from two conventional geophones and the challenges that comes with it. So we will discuss a few uh, perturbation type of perturbation, which has impact on the gradient, and then we assess uh, their impact and rank them in, into sensitivity chart. To fully describe the motion of a rigid body, we can measure its motion, linear motion, along three orthogonal directions, or particle velocity, denoted here by Vx, Vy, Vz, and also its rotation along this, uh, around the same axis, Rx, Ry, Rz. The relation between the particle velocity and the rotation is denoted with these equations, and as you can see, uh, the difference between spatial gradients uh, indicate the rotational motion of, of a rigid body. However, most of our seismic experiments are conducted at the surface of the Earth, which means that the free surface boundary conditions are satisfied. Therefore, the rotation around the horizontal axis, Rx and Ry, are simplified, and it is sufficient to either measure those rotation or the horizontal gradient of the vertical component or the vertical gradient of the horizontal component. But in this lecture, we're interested in the rotation around the y-axis because that's sensitive to the Rayleigh motion and to the vertically polarized shear waves. There are already uh, many rotational sensors and they are based on uh, different physical principles. For example, the electrochemical rotational sensor measures the uh, current induced by the flow of an iron-rich fluid uh, triggered by rotation, whereas the ring laser gyroscope, for example, measures uh, an optical effect, whereby uh, the light traveling in opposite direction experience a time shift. However, uh, these rotational sensors are not suitable for a large-scale seismic experiments. And therefore, it is more uh, feasible to try to acquire a gradient measurement by taking the difference between two conventional, closely spaced conventional geophones. An example of that is the rotaphone, which you can see in the picture. So how does uh, the translational motion and the rotational motion of the Rayleigh wave look like? So consider this seismic synthetic example whereby a wave is generated, a Rayleigh wave is generated along the surface, which you can see propagating. And then when we put a, a sensor a few hundred meters away, the signal on the horizontal and the vertical is shown in the seismogram next to it. So we see a behavior which is typical to the Rayleigh wave, for example. There is a phase shift between the vertical and horizontal component, as well as an amplitude difference. If you put another sensor, either spaced vertically or horizontally, as you can see in the panels there. The blue dots in this case denote the two geophones. And then follow their motion. Uh, you see there is a tilt, they are start to tilt, which is actually the rotational motion. Uh, for the case where you put two horizontal uh, geophones placed vertically, we see a change in amplitude, which uh, results in the rotational motion. Whereas in the case of two vertical geophones, you see a phase shift. Uh, resulting in a small angle difference. The corresponding signal of the rotation of motion is shown to the right. As you can see, the signal is very small compared to, the rotational signal is very small compared to the translational motions. So how does the rotation mo motion or the gradient looks like in a real data example? So here is a field test whereby uh, we put a number of geophones in a, a desert area and then uh, computed the gradient from two receivers placed 30 centimeters apart. So we see a common receiver gather, uh, whereby the vertical component 
uh, it's composed mostly of uh, surface wave, as you can see, and reflections. And next to it is the gradient gather computed from uh, two adjacent vertical components. You see that the, the type of wave recorded by the two uh, uh, measurements looks more or less similar. The gradient in this case is just a scaled version of the vertical component. However, if you sort the data in a common shot gather, you see there are some differences between the vertical component and the gradient. The waves are no longer as smooth, even though actually we expect some differences, variation from one receiver gather to another. The jittering you see there is generally uh, attributed to perturbation. And if you consider the gradient and the impacts that, uh, and the, perturba the type of perturbation that could affect the gradients, you can think about the, the fact that we're trying to estimate a point measurement by finite differencing. So the spacing will play a role in the variation in the jittering you see. Also variation in the sensor specs could attribute to the lack of coherency you observe, as well as the deployment related uh, perturbations such as tilt and coupling. And there are also perturbations which are related to the conditions in the field, such as noise and statics. So one of the main questions when we try to estimate the gradient is the how far apart should you put your receivers, so the delta x. And from the theory point of view, the smaller the distance, the more accurate your response will be. As you can see in this plot where we show the magnitude response of the gradient as a function of the horizontal wave number. If the black line in this uh, graph is the, is the accurate, is the point gradient, the closer the lines, the more accurate the response is. So you see when the delta x, in this case, the receiver spacing normalized by the minimum wavelength, the smaller the spacing, the more accurate the measurement is. So from this point of view, uh, you would choose a spacing which is one over 16 of the, uh, of the Nyquist spacing. However, as soon as you start uh, perturbing that measurement, so if you have a tilt error, for example, the smallest spacing is no longer accurate because for those uh, wave numbers, the error due to the tilt will dominate and uh, your gradient is no longer accurate. So you're better off increasing that spacing to one eighth in this case. So this is the same field experiment which I showed you slides uh, ago. So in the top uh, graph, you see the tilt angle per, uh, measured for each receivers. And as you can see, it varies quite a bit. So uh, we picked the sensor which has the largest error, in this case, sensor A, and we compare it to sensor B, which has a small tilt uh, error. So we'll focus on the gradient uh, of the uh, surface waves or the radio wave in this case, which is denoted by the red box. And you can see we computed the gradient for two uh, receiver spacing, one for two uh, receiver pair, which is separated by 30 centimeter, and the other one by three meters. And as a reference, we computed the gradient in the wave number domain, which we consider more accurate. So you can see that the, for the receiver with a 16 degrees tilt error, the different gradients are not consistent, neither in phase nor in amplitude. Whereas for the bottom one, with sensor B with tilt error of one degree, the gradients are quite consistent in phase, whereby the gradient with 30 centimeters is more accurate as it is close to the reference gradient. As in practice, we can't separate the different perturbations in the real data, but still we want to understand their impact. So that's why we conducted a, a synthetic study, whereby we introduce each, per, each perturbation separately. For example, the, uh, we used the transfer function of, uh, uh, of the geophones in, a, in order to introduce sensitivity and natural frequency error as, as they're indicated by the tolerance level in, uh, by the manufacturer. And we also introduced tilt error and coupling a positioning error. So the way we quantified the error is that we computed, we introduced the error to one receiver, then we computed the gradient and then we quantify the error with respect to the unperturbed case. The errors are in DBE. So we summarize the impact of these errors, as you can see in this chart, whereby uh, the perturbation are highlighted there. <coughs> the top uh, perturbation are related to the geophone itself. So like the temperature, the damping, the frequency, and the sensitivity. The other perturbation are related to the deployment, such as the positioning of the receiver with respect to each other, the coupling and the tilt. And the last two are related to the conditions in the field. 
such as the ambient noise and statics. So we computed the gradient for two spacings, gradient spacing, uh, here expressed as a fraction of the minimum wavelength for 0 0.08 and 0 0.3. And then uh, this arrow indicates the increasing error. So we defined, uh, we estimated that a gradient with a good quality should have an error less than minus 30 dB. And you can see that a lot of uh, the error related to the deployment has a large impact on the gradient, with the tilt and the positioning being the maximum. So it's possible to measure the spatial gradient of the wave field. However, perturbation needs to be minimized. For example, the distance between two receivers used for the gradient needs to be between one eighth and one third of the minimum wavelength in order to minimize the impact of uh, the perturbations. Further, improving the accuracy of the spatial gradient requires low variance in sensor sensitivity, which amounts to less than 5% variance. It also requires accurate positioning in the order of centimeters rather than uh, tens of centimeters, and the tilt error should be less than 5 degrees. It requires as well uh, a well planting of the geophones to avoid any resonance effect. So finally, I would like to thank my colleagues for helping me with this material. And I would like to thank uh, Western GECO for acquiring the data and Schlumberger for permission to publish. If you like this presentation, please visit the EEG YouTube channels for more e-lectures.